What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. I am Justin Proper. I'm here with uh, Zod. And today we are going to talk about something interesting. This is a new installment in the series uh, that I call a real conversation where we discuss various films that have been released that can be either controversial or people have different opinions on it. The first time we did this was with, with uh, Scream 5, and I'm really looking forward to that. We have Graven Something Scary coming on, and uh, I'm a big fan of his. And so that's going to be very exciting. And we also, uh, that's for Scream 6, uh, next, uh, just in a few weeks. Um, and then we did Halloween Ends, very controversial. Uh, and now we are in our third installment, uh, where we are talking about Cocaine Bear and Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Now, initially, I wanted to do Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey on its own with Zod and uh, with somebody who actually really liked the film. Scheduling conflicts, you know, kind of got in the way. So I figured instead, why don't we just break down and discuss the differences between the newly released Cocaine Bear and Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. And for those of you who don't know, Cocaine Bear is pretty simple. A bear eats a ton of cocaine, 40 kilos worth, and goes on a violent rampage. It is based on a real story where an actual bear uh, consumed a bunch of cocaine, didn't kill anybody as far as I'm concerned, and, uh, and died, and died. It went from Tennessee to Georgia. And real drug smugglers dropped a bunch of cocaine, not for the reasons that are displayed in the film. The guy wasn't a bumbling idiot like that, but the guy did die uh from the parachute not um deploying so uh i'd like yeah. to think though that that actually happened like the yeah. guy was so hopped up on coke he just smacked his head because i'm still in my mind they have no details and i'm still hoping that's the actual story um they do <laughs> well they do have details um in, in fact uh, i'm not gonna go too far into that but basically uh it's a it's based on like true events but they took creative liberties and just ha presented a what if scenario. What if this bear survived? Uh, what if this bear won went on a cocaine fueled rampage and just savagely mauled uh, a bunch of people? What would that look like? What would have happened? And <laughs> there's, there's a lot of interesting things that come out of that film. Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, for example, uh, uh, for, for uh, just for comparison, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey was a cash grab to get uh, just because uh, they wanted to take advantage of the uh, Winnie the Pooh character being in the public domain. And they sort of, you know, they just cranked out an independent film, also presented a what if scenario. However, there are huge differences between Cocaine Bear and Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. And Zod, we are going to talk about both of them. So first off, since Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey came out first, Zod, what were your initial thoughts? Holy Jesus. So um, my initial thoughts, uh, first of all, I was hyped as hell because I've been waiting for somebody to butcher the Winnie the Pooh license in the public domain. Uh, <laughs> so I've been super excited about this because uh, if you guys know my history with Disney, uh, we have a very we have a very complicated relationship. Mm. So I was like, you know what? Uh, you know what? F Disney. Because it's about time with all of the shenanigans they've been pulling recently, someone kind of got at them and took their beloved IP and drove it into the ground. And the thing that's interesting about this film is for the first 10 minutes, it lures you into thinking it might actually be good. Uh, there is some really good hand-drawn intro that where you get, a, you go, oh, okay, all right, I, I like this idea, I like the direction. And then we get to the live action actors, and that's when you realize what kind of a movie you're in for. And when the first lines were spoken, I said, oh, we're in it's for a ride. one of those. <laughs> we're we're, in, we're it, in for a treat. But no, overall, all, overall, though. Okay, so keep in mind, my opinion is going to be heavily skewed by alcohol. Uh, I right had, now? No. Oh, oh, when you when, watched it. When I watched it. So I, my, I was I was gonna say I have a beer right here. So like that's that's <laughs> cool by me. I mean, that's that's no. fine. When we're talking about these kinds of movies, uh, you know, it they are a better time when you've had a few drinks. Uh you're you're able to enjoy it more. Um 
so but, yeah, yeah. We, but winnie the pooh blood and honey did not help just spoiler alert the, the, no no amount of drugs helped so for me um i went with um my uh girlfriend bitchy unicorn and um, we had both had a few drinks, so our experience was less, let's say, um, less, uh, it was less of a bad time, I think, but if I had to gauge by the people in the theater with us who quite obviously weren't drinking, uh, like, I think, like, two people walked out, <laughs> I think that I, there I are... I don't blame them. I yeah, don't blame I, them. I, I, I think uh, other people were like laughing and I think through the review we'll point that out. But for a basic time, I would say I thought Jeepers Creepers Reborn is the worst movie I've ever seen. So comparatively, this wasn't on that level for me. The worst ever of all time? Oh, 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 oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, we need wow. to do a separate video on that. But, um, yeah. but for me, this was just – it was just – Bad, but not bad where I couldn't have fun with it. And if someone came up to me and they said, uh, hey, Zod, would you recommend this? I would definitely say, oh, hell no, or stipulation, get drunk with a bunch of friends and throw it out in the background. But this mm -hmm. would not be something I'd recommend. I wouldn't go out there and defend it like these crazy people that we've heard. I, I wouldn't defend this movie. Um, if someone has a bad opinion, I 100% agree with it. But just from my experience, and, and I think when you go to the theater, you got to factor that in. Like sometimes mm -hmm. the crowd and what you're doing at the time can greatly uh, kind of skew your view on a movie. But this isn't a movie I buy. This isn't a movie I'd rent. This isn't a movie I'd even probably watch for free. This is like I watched it once. I don't ever need to see it again. <laughs> yeah. Well, In fact, well, I'd let you know where I'm at with this. <laughs> yeah, that, that pretty much sums it up right there. Uh, and personally, I I I thought that this movie was uh, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey was absolutely. I uh, I mean, I, I get it. It's an independent film, and they're having fun with it, and it looks like they had a great time on set. But the problem with this is that it just really played itself way too seriously i've said this uh a few times in different streams but yeah it, it just it, it did not stick the landing you know you have this great opportunity this great concept uh you have uh the oh you you have this property that's very well known oh now open to the public domain and what do you do what do you do make a horror film about winnie the pooh and piglet killing people fantastic that's great and what are you going to do with it? What's the tone you're going to set? You're going to make it serious? Uh, I 100% I no. agree with no, that. No, absolutely like, not. That is that is not what you do. <laughs> There's like, one. It's one thing to play it seriously with like a comedic undertone, but there was no comedic undertone whatsoever. It just played as a straight slasher film with just terrible acting, terrible writing. And I mean, prop, props to the guy for actually getting it made and getting the funding for it. I mean, good for you, but I just, I, I didn't appreciate it. I support the idea. Uh, I just think the execution was pretty, pretty awful. Um, and, and this is the weird, I, I, and I said this to you off air. Um, and this is the weird thing about this is that uh, you can have independent films where you feel like it, they're obvious cash grabs this to me and i know we're gonna play some clips of the interview and stuff this to me doesn't feel exactly like a cash grab but at the same time um a lot of bad choices were made and i 100 percent agree with your first statement when i thought like the other movie we'll be talking about cocaine bear they'd go with something absurd because obviously these two are both absurd concepts and I think the biggest comparison here is one chose to lean into what it was and the other one chose to kind of try to play it straight. And, and mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, that within itself is a very bold choice. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean because you have a bold idea and you you stick to your guns with it and, and you know, respect to that. Like respect to any filmmaker who makes a film and they have the balls to do it and they have a concept and they stick with it and they don't let – people change their opinions like good for that dude i commend you for that but there's things that don't work inherently and no matter how hard you try 
you're not going to make it stick because the concept doesn't allow. And unfortunately, the concept does not allow for something serious with Winnie the Pooh and playing it straight. If you're going to go that route, you need some good actors. You need some good funding. You need a lot more than clearly the budget provided. And yeah, yeah. you could say a lot of that's not their fault, but it is because then, all right, you wait until your first film does decent, which this would have. There was a lot of buzz on, around it, and then if it you want to go that route, you yeah, you, you change it up later. But f- what what do they say? First impressions, you only get them once, right? Mm, and this is a bad yeah. first impression. I don't care what anybody says. This is a bad, bad first impression. Uh, I I I I agree. Uh, and not not only that, uh, but. I, when I was saying that this this felt like a you know a cash grab, what I really mean is like this felt like a great opportunity to just jump on it as soon as it became public domain. Like they were ready for this, uh, but I just think at the same time they sort of rushed it out. And I'm I'm thinking like how long how long was this sitting on the back burner, just waiting for the uh, the exclusive. Disney rights to expire. That's what I'm curious about. And also, um, what what really puzzles me about about this is that you know just because you can do it doesn't mean you should, <laughs> for sure. Um, but yeah, I just think that they they just rushed a little too quickly on the opportunity to jump on it before anybody else could, and it didn't work. You know, and it, it just it was the wrong tone uh, or the not. It's not wrong. It's just an opinion. But like, hey, you know, if if you're going to do something this absurd, you should lean into that. And there was no leaning into it whatsoever. I mean, and the the fact, too, that you uh, don't have the caliber of actors. And and we'll talk about that when we get to Cocaine Bear, because like just cast comparatively, if you look at the casting for that and look at the casting for this, like Coke Bear by all rights has some pretty terrible lines that I actually physically heard them say in that movie. But the actors are so good that they could take some stuff that might have not worked if you had another person doing it. And with their delivery and the way that they they say it and stuff and the way that they did do the take, you, they can make it work. But in this right. one. These guys felt like uh, – I think uh, Bitchy put it best. She said it felt like a film student uh, shooting that, Yes, yes. There are, there, are many, there are many films like that where I'm like, I would be very impressed if this was a student film. Uh, you know, but yeah. uh, it, but this is a, a this is a full production. This he, isn't a student I still, project. <laughs> I, think he, he, I don't know how old he is, but I have a feeling that he's not that old, so he's not far away from college age. So I can kind of – I can kind of understand that. And, you know, if anything, I don't, I don't want him to like never work ever again. Uh, You know, I, I want him to improve. Like that's, that's the thing. I'm not, I'm not coming at this as a place of, you know, and this is what I do uh, sometimes on um, the fandom collective channel where uh, a rookie critic, uh, he's the guy that uh, had conducts all of these, uh, fan film reactions we've watched a ton of them uh, it was basically a co-host uh, <laughs> so we did so many of them um but I, I i had said there like um on on a few different uh on a few different recordings and videos that we we understand what it's like to go out and make a film put yourself out there we know it from an amateur perspective. And when we critique something, when we criticize it, we want it to be better. We don't want you to fail, you know, and us critiquing it is not us insulting you as a person, which is something a lot of Hollywood, you know, will <laughs> will, will, will do a lot. They'll take it personally. Uh, film critics will be, you know, I feel like sometimes it's disingenuous when you have uh, a, like a personal relationship, you know, you like one film, but then you don't like another and they don't want to talk to you ever again because everyone's a critic. You know, it's just like let people have their opinions, talk about it, have a conversation, even if you you don't have to take everything that we say at heart and we don't have to take it uh, like every single critique. Like sometimes we could be wrong or you disagree with it. That's OK. But take take some sort of feedback that actually would help you improve and then you will you will thrive 
And that's and that's where that comes from. And uh, I believe the guy's name is Rise Freak Waterfield. And uh, I, after watching Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, I saw this interview uh, that I'm going to bring up here. Um, it's from uh, Kings of Horror, where uh, he interviewed the guy. Um, and uh, he, yeah, as you can see, he's a pretty young guy, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. He's got to be, like, coming out of film school, I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's yeah. younger than us on the panel. I, th I think he's younger me. than me, which is, is, is it, Holy makes shit. Me think, it makes me think, <laughs> like, what the hell have I been doing with my life? This guy is already making a, made a movie, and I'm like, Jeez. <laughs> yeah. So, so like it, it's so like ew, props for making a film. Like I think it's important that everybody who watches this knows like uh, utmost respect. Like if we go after someone from like say Marvel or something like that, those people have been doing it for years and it's a different sort of that's, thing. That's There's, different. The big yeah, companies, the, they should, you should know better. You should know better. But like someone yeah. like this, you could definitely tell he, he's starting out and just starting to get his footing in. So I think like seeing his second or third movie, because you know they're going to put out more of these. They already announced it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the be... sequel to Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. There's a Peter Pan one that's coming out, which I think they could go into very interesting and creative directions. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, but we're not going to go into that. He's also, yeah, Bambi as well, which could be fun. But if they're playing, if it, he chooses the tone of serious like way too serious, then it's not going to work. He's going to continue to not have well-received films. And that's, that's just how it is. Um, but if he plays up the joke, like we, the filmmakers are in on it, the audience is in on it, then we can have more fun. Then we can have, you know, a, a more back and forth dialogue. Like, uh, and we'll get into cocaine bear after this, but uh, this is in regards to, to the hate that this guy has gotten, um, this is this is what he answered when he was asked about um, what he wants to uh, tell the audience uh, who's going to who's going to maybe watch this film and what the reception has been. And I believe this was before it came out um, when the when it became viral. But uh, here here are his words on it went viral. There's two camps of people, people who love it and then people who absolutely hate it. And the, the people who are against me they're really against me. I get messages daily. Um, we've had like petitions getting made, death threats, like someone was off, um, saying they'll call the police on us, like crazy. <laughs> like, like, look, like, look, okay, so we see this, we see right. this nonsense when we're, say, talking about, okay, so for instance, because I don't want to get off track, but I feel it pertains to the state. Yes, yes, sure. Um, I review The Last of Us. I personally have loved every episode. Um, I've played the game. <clears throat> Unlike, I feel like some of these people reviewing, I'm not going to mention names, but I, I feel like they don't get the game. But anyways, that's neither here nor there. But with that show, there's been a lot of hate for putting in some uh, things as far as uh, homosexuality in it. And I feel like this show has actually been the first to actually do it very well. And it makes sense to the story that they're telling. Um, sure. And if you've played the game, the undertones are literally in the first game, which everyone hails. But for some reason now they forget these scenes were in the game and they've been going sure. crazy. And I feel like it pertains to this like here, like, like, OK, let's not kid ourselves who took the winnie the pooh property it was disney and disney's a horrible company and there's a lot of stuff with the original winnie the pooh and uh, i wish i had done my homework and had some things but there's a lot of shady shit with the production and shit there with the people who made that where a the lot of things had, uh it's uh it's more of the cartoon and stuff there's a lot of people who okay have been, well uh the, i don't but how does it how does it pertain to 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 this instance, because like so, what, what stood out to me was when he said somebody threatened to call the police, call the police. Like, that's what I wanted to harp on calling the police because uh, you made a movie. <laughs> like, you made you a movie say? and you're going to call the police on somebody. For, that's not an emergency, but that's you're wasting people's time. You, you Karen. Like, and, and, and death threats, please. Like, and I've seen this too. Even with things that I vehemently despise, I'm looking at you, She-Hulk. Um, I would never call the creatives up and be like, I, I'm going to kill you because you made something I don't like. Like, that's just ridiculous. Like, yeah, knock on it. 
uh, come on, YouTube. That comes with the game. I'm sorry, everybody who makes these movies and films. You should just know there's going to be assholes like us who are going to critique it and probably be harsh and tell jokes. But when you take it to going on someone's Twitter or uh, sending them messages threatening their lives, it's like, come on, really? You have that much time on your hands that Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey is going to be the, the thing you threaten someone's life over? And uh, that's a criminal offense, guys. Like, <laughs> I, I, you're, you're, I just you're committing I, I just a criminal don't. offense for Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Come yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 just one of those things that it just bothers me. And uh, what he says afterwards, uh, it you know, it it, ma it makes me respect at least respect uh, the guy Rise Frank Waterfield as a person. Again, a as a filmmaker, yeah, his movie was terrible. Sorry, Rise. It was it was not good. But um, what he's what he, this is what he said I was off, um, saying they'll call the police on us like crazy things. <laughs> and um, yeah, the main thing I, I like tell all these people is you don't have to watch it. Like it's like really simple. You. <laughs> is, you've got you know, this version you know. of Winnie the Pooh, which you guys, you know, that's your what you love. Uh, we've made this alternative version of him, which is a really horrifying version. Um, but I'm not going to I'm not going to sit you down, strap open your eyes right. and make you watch this film. Like it's it's there. It's there for horror fans. It's there for people who want to have right. this see this interesting take on what was, you know, the, like the the 1926 cuddly version and see it adapted into a a brutal killer. Um, yeah, that's uh, so so yeah. I mean, clearly like this guy is not a complete lunatic. Like he's he's fairly normal. So I, I again why we're why we're harping on that is like the in, the intent behind it also matters. And yes, this has been a long time coming with Wendy the Pooh, and we will get to cocaine there, believe you me. Um, but yeah, so I mean, so when it comes to that, in this interview, there's also something that's quite fascinating. If I can get uh, to that, I'm just going to take a second to try to find uh, the timestamp for it. Um, but Zod, uh, if you could. Uh, address some of some of your thoughts on um I, I, because while while intent does matter it, it it also um you know what matters is the final product uh so and that's going to lead into the next clip uh so just just uh you know give me your thoughts on you know his take on it uh and just go for it so i think the take on it was a good direction to go into I think the, uh, like I said, five minute intro was a good way to hook people. Where I think the movie honestly fails is, like you've said, and we're both in agreement on that, is the serious tone. Like, uh, you you did tell me there was like a reference. He likes like Halloween and things like that. And the, the thing about it is uh, there are a lot of directors who have been inspired by other people but i think where some directors fall into a trap and others excel is that they try to faithfully recreate what another director did not knowing that that director it, that was the style all their own you, you can't right. replicate that style and when you do people will notice that you got if you want that style you got to put your own stamp on it you know you got to put your own um you got to put your own um sort of self into the product your own signature. And, yeah your own signature and i feel like as young as this guy is and i'm gonna guess this is his first movie um i don't think he's established a style unique to himself and i think that he has the potential of being a very good director because he's got obviously he seems like a cool dude he's got a positive outlook he's got a positive take on the criticisms obviously he's getting now and he's been getting before this thing was even released yeah. and i think that if he takes that part and then kind of starts to set up his own unique style where he can you could say oh yeah rise made that film that's you know whether you like or hate him that's his style i don't think he's got that yet i think he tried to imitate a lot of carpenter a lot of different things and put it into a film where it doesn't work and, and if you go back to carpenter or wes craven or any of those guys they had people from back in the day that they admired. You can hear the interviews. They got a bunch of interviews with guys, especially Carpenter. And mm -hmm. you'd be surprised their inspirations 
but they knew they needed to put themselves and make their at, own at a stamp. certain point yeah yeah, yeah. at a you're, certain you're, point you're correct you're correct at a certain point and a lot of uh the films that they may have made in the, their film experience prior we don't we don't always get to see that because that's sort of buried uh <laughs> oh i have i i've seen early carpenter i've seen early craven what let me tell you guys okay and I know probably horror people community will come at me, but it, it, let's yeah. face facts. Their early movies were not good. They were not good at all. They were bordering on I, horrendous. I, I, I would, had bombs. Yeah. Uh, and, well, sure, sure, throughout his career. But I will say, like, even, like, with uh, Wes Craven, that you talked about him, The Last House on the Left, that original film, I did not like it as much as I liked uh, the remake. The remake was a lot more the, well done, uh, and it just the remake was much better. It, yeah, yeah, and I guess it's uh, you know, it's sort of the the time that it came out, and also just the, the style of it. And again, you know, with these kind of things, you know, this this young director is is learning, like still learning, and all directors uh, still and writers because he did write the film too, and. Yeah, um, that's a whole different conversation. I mean, uh, Wes Craven had that one movie. Um, it was, oh, it was so you terrible. I blocked it. Uh, no, it was the one, uh, Take My Something Away or something. I don't know. It was in the 90s before Scream. It was a really bad film though it came after like him nightmare on elm street yeah and it came and, after nightmare on elm street it was like in between when he was still trying to reinvent himself yeah i sold the tape that's, hey, other... that's what it was oh it's what a terrible it? movie it's i think it's called my soul to take it was a horrendous movie and you've probably never heard of it because most people haven't i went to see it in the theaters and I can tell you right now, it was when he – you could see his transition where he started doing the Scream style of stuff, and he still put Nightmare on Elm Street elements, and they just did not mesh together. And then okay. he made Scream, and the rest is history. So, <laughs> um, l Let me see what it was called. The People Under the Stairs, Shocker, uh, Vampire in Brooklyn, My Soul to Take. Uh, that was yes. in 2010. That was in 2010. That, that, was, that was different. Uh, but I, I understand what you're trying to say. But yeah, um, but go, and uh, to go back to the the argument of this is just an independent film. This guy's young. Um, uh, the director actually addresses this in this interview. Have had beforehand. Yeah. So when you um, produce a film on a low budget, you there are a lot of constraints. Um, you need to decide where to allocate your time and your resources. Um, we put a lot of those into the death scenes now. What I really wanted to do was when it started to go as viral. Okay, so so they put it a lot into the death scenes. Interesting. Interesting. Um, uh, yeah, but I get that. But there's also all this other stuff surrounding it that are also important. It's not just about the kills, the brutality. You know, it, it, and even, even that, like, some of the kills were, were done kind of well but it, it's just as soon as you put in like cgi blood that's obvious then i i lose it i lose it uh like the mean one with the grinch serial killer movie the ugh, that was that was dreadful but oh yeah but yeah so allocating all the time to the to the kills that's that, that explains some of the bad writing um <laughs> if you will and it started to go as viral as it has was make sure there was a lot of action in the film because um you know ultimately mm. that's what people really want to see like when i'm going to see a horror movie no <laughs> not necessarily <laughs> but this is i, this is, yeah. I mean okay to an extent because we'll talk about cocaine bear and that is uh, we keep saying issue. that but trust me like we need to take time with both of them uh, yeah, um, in that one, I felt like his point of view was missing from that film, and we'll get into it when we get to that. But um, th at the same point, to their strength, the the slow times in between really helped flesh out a lot of things and help build me caring about the characters. This movie, I did not care about anybody. Yeah, and I think we could all agree. There was yeah, not one likable character in the movie. Yeah, even even uh, Christopher Robin, who was in it, like oh, he was it, terrible. 
it, it, it was well it was so poorly done and then they just skipped to a bunch of valley girls uh a uh, valley british girls uh who are like whatever and, and, and like the girl and it, that's being, boring that's boring like it, and, and the girl being naked being put through a wood chipper right like is that was to me such a uh no that to me was such a bad uh it was such a poor scene because it felt like oh boobs you know what i mean we just gotta show boobs to keep the people invested in the kill That's like it. when you really think about that what was the point can, can, of having her I naked wish, of having her naked before they put her in a wood chipper like he rips the shirt off but why you, you could have put that you could you could i i don't understand it and then scenes where it would have made sense to have some nudity there was nothing there was one nude scene and it the girl got killed but the context doesn't make sense and that's where i disagree like that's where your action is hurting it because it, it's random there's no reasoning for it right and that's why i chose this interview because it's it's so fascinating uh to to see that and again young guy but still you don't you don't need boobs to hold people's attention all the time uh i mean you're yes i know like that that's that's maybe the gay part of me that's like you know not interested in that i mean when i was when i was younger yeah yeah i mean you know nudity and violence was what i kind of cared about but that was like 11 year old me that was 12 year old me you know who cared about that sort of thing um nowadays i care more about story and characters and whether or not I care if they die or if they live, who am I rooting for? And this, you know, you should be rooting for Christopher Robin, but he's not in most of the film. We focus on these other ladies and the one final girl uh, is the only backstory we get is that she had a stalker once and carries a gun. I'm like, cool. This this didn't have to be Winnie the Pooh though. <laughs> and, 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 and to your point, it's like, yeah, she had a traumatic experience from that. But to the story aspect you were talking about, there's nothing beyond that, and that's where this movie goes wrong because it's like, okay, right. she's traumatized, but she doesn't grow from the experience. She doesn't gain courage, and she dies, and, and uh, yeah, and earn the final girl status. Even if you have her die at the end of the movie, I, spoiler shit. That's fine. Oh, no, I, I did that on purpose. If you're this far into the into the uh, into the video, thank you. First off, uh, but also, uh, yeah. If if you're if you're expecting no spoilers, that's not going to happen. Um, so, but yeah. So, spoiler: when she died, that could have been impactful, and I feel like that scene was supposed to be impactful. But the issue is, I don't care about her, and there's no journey for her character. It's just, oh, I'm terrified. I have a gun. Um, she does some things that are stupid. We'll probably talk about later. And then she yeah. dies. And then there's, Christopher there's Robin, nothing. the other, yeah, there's nothing there. And then Christopher Robin, most of his lines are like, why, why, or why, why? Like, it, you know, it, it's like ridiculous. Like, it, 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 so yeah. But anyways, let, let's carry on. Movie. I want to see a lot of the villain. Um, so, for example, in Halloween Ends, that wasn't my favorite Halloween because there wasn't a lot of Michael Myers. And I Michael agree. Myers was getting beat up by, you know, uh, like a geeky kid. <laughs> that's not what I want to see. Yeah, yeah, that's why I want to have a beer with him. <laughs> I, I, I knew when he brought that up, I go, oh, he won, he won uh, just over because there's... That's yeah. like your exact, I feel like that was your exact critique of that movie when we did that. <laughs> uh, among, among other things, among other things. But uh, so clearly he understands what, what this shows though, is that he understands where movies go wrong. And so, but when he does it himself, sometimes like, like it's good, it's good to, you know, step back and just look at it from a, a third person perspective, if you can. You know, as a writer, it's very important to do that. As a director, very important to do that, to look at your films as objectively as possible. And, you know, uh, so again, again, he understands when, when things go wrong in other films, but maybe in this one, I, I don't know. I'm going to have to see more interviews with him and see what he, to get more into his mindset. 
Um, so for me, I was like, with the reshoots, I could do bigger things, and I had a bit. Oh, more... by the way, he had to do a bunch of reshoots uh, because uh, it to, to make the film better, uh, and because there was uh, there was more funding that came in. So he had an opportunity, and that's another thing. He had an opportunity to make it better, but chose to do more things with the violence. I don't that, know. That actually explains a lot because I was saying that I don't know if you noticed, but there were some rough cuts in this film. Yeah. And, uh, some ADR issues and things like that, where I could tell that something was up. But now you bringing up that interview makes so much more sense to me because that was that. Yeah, there was some rough stuff in there. Yeah, and we can we could go on uh, much longer about uh, about. Uh, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, but I think it's about time that we talk about Cocaine Bear, though, uh, because we, we've talked about uh, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey long enough, but I, I did feel that it was important to address uh, some of those uh, specific points and, you know, where his mindset was. Um, with Cocaine Bear, it was a little more straightforward. Um, you know, it was like the movie wrote itself <laughs> in a way. I mean, um, so you have, and the difference between these two obviously independent film young guy maybe doesn't know uh, like everything about filmmaking then you have like you know a seasoned veteran elizabeth banks you know who is you know competent in filmmaking and in acting respectively uh doesn't act in the film unfortunately but that'd be kind of fun oh i i have some things to say about elizabeth banks oh okay so well, we well i want to jump it, right into if it pertains to cocaine bear, okay. it does. It does. Uh, but and... yeah, sure. Uh, but I, I will say though, um, this cocaine bear is everything that I wanted Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey to be. You know, uh, obviously having a bigger budget, and better actors, or more experienced actors, I should say, uh, uh, definitely helped sell this film. Like if this was, and the cinematography was more well done. It actually looked like a movie. <laughs> <laughs> if that, uh, yeah, I think. Okay, so and fair. and mo most importantly, before I forget, Cocaine Bear knew exactly what it was and what it wanted to be, and succeeded on many levels. Again, as I said, being in on the joke, uh, where he's when the poop blood and honey took itself too seriously, and that's where that's where uh, the director, um, you know, focusing his time more on the action and the and the kills and you got more money for reshoots okay great what are you gonna do we're just gonna make the kills better like that's that's it no like second take on the dialogue at all no like rewrite uh, for god's like sakes rewrite the dialogue because all of it was trash let's just be there was a classic though we did get a classic line from that movie and that was that one chick who looked and said, I think the killer wrote this. <laughs> dude, dude, I am going to immortalize that as one of my top ten on the, on the, best worst on, lines ever spoke. <laughs> on, the, on, the, uh, on the patio, on the sliding door. Oh, yeah, God. but <laughs> I think the killer wrote that. Yes, obviously. Uh, no like, shit. Th this, this is... I uh, felt like that was a perfect time for uh, Bill Inglom uh, to be there and go, here's your sign. Because <laughs> I was like, that's, I got to that part of the movie and that's where I got confused. And I'm like, are they really in on the joke or is this serious? And then, of course, I finished the movie and go, oh, God, uh, this is where really you could have been right there, Justin, right there. You could have been in on the joke, and I think that's a, a lot of what we're talking about in comparison right. here. Is there were so many moments in that movie where we laughed out loud, and it feels like the director is on in on the joke, but they're not. Clearly, by this interview and what we know now, they're they're not. But right, they could have been if right. they would have leaned into those stupid lines. Yes. Like, you had more like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like it, it has to be, you know, because you when you write stupid lines, like there's a way to do it where it's it's funny and you know what you're doing and then there's a way to just be lazy like th that's and that's where oh, a lot of people oh, fail no i i wouldn't even say it was lazy given what you showed me now i think this is a situation where it was unintentionally bad i i, I mean I, maybe i'm giving too much credit but i i just because of how nice this guy is and how much he seems to be yes. committed i want to say 
it was just a screw up and nobody caught it. And I think if this guy had, you mentioned something great. You said a, a third perspective, right? Stepping outside of your work. I don't think he had anybody looking at his script because it's independent. You have a lot more control. I think if he would have had somebody who would have looked at that line and went like, bro, if you're going with a serious tone, this is not what this, this is not the way say. to do it. <laughs> no, you, can be, like, you can be serious with the that, kills, but you can't be serious with uh, like anything else. Like really, uh, even with the kills, make it goofy. Like one of my favorite scenes in, when we're in regards to cocaine bear. Um, so, so we can talk a little bit more about that. Uh, I, I really enjoyed some of these, uh, some of the kills. They, they could have been more, uh, brutal but that's that's fine you know it's not a huge budget but it's infinitely bigger than winnie the pooh money for sure um i mean just with actors alone uh but uh for me like my favorite scene in cocaine bear and this is this is a se sequence uh that i absolutely love so yeah a lot a lot of things happen to lead up to this point but there's a scene where the ambulance like the medics come by and <laughs> they find the bear and this guy's severed head and chaos ensues uh the bear knocks the door over and then he like well before then he like slowly closed the door open as the bear is like <laughs> has like a bunch of blood coming from its mouth and he's just shocked uh, you know and slowly closing the door it's a cheap little gimmick but it works because that's how little things like that help you play up the joke and my favorite scene is right after that, where they're in the ambulance, the guy is running to get to the ambulance, and this cocaine-fueled bear is chasing after the ambulance. He launches, slow motion, launches into the back of this open ambulance and starts tearing everyone apart. Uh, the lady who's in a stretcher and strapped in <laughs> falls out and... <laughs> It just it's grinding on the pavement of the road and it, her reaction her delivery that actress is so funny and the guy having like his limp hand after it gets gets mauled by the bear uh he literally gnaws at his head and then the lady who's driving crashes into a tree she flies out the window because she didn't you know seat belts are important guys uh you know just that whole sequence I, I went in the theater I was at people were laughing hysterically and we even clapped at the end of that scene we liked it so much we're like yes this is exactly what we hoped for this is what we wanted this is what we expect I mean what what, what did you and, th and that's the kind of tone that cocaine bear gives uh to to the audience you know sets that standard I mean, even with the opening, when the, the guy's dropping a bunch of cocaine and then he's uh, coked out and then he uh, hits his head on, on the I, plane. Gonna, okay, so I'm going to be a little bit uh, different. Like, yes, the ambulance scene is going to be 90% probably of what people remember. And I think we can all agree that's a – that is yeah, a that's, great scene. That's the moment in the mo movie that everyone's going to clip. Everyone's going to be like, this is a great scene from this movie. Yeah, like that's Even one out of, of context, those, it's perfect. Uh, yeah, that's one of those That's one of those scenes that people will remember for a long time. But I'll be honest with you, my favorite scene is the one you're talking about right now. And the reason why I like it is because um, there's a bit of subtlety. And you could tell this guy has been doing the coke because of the way he's acting. Mm -hmm. And so he's all fueled up on this coke. And then when he whacks his head, just at that moment, that's when I knew I was going to like the film. Because I like uh, slapstick physical comedy. Uh, you know, the days of Chris Farley and things like that. And just the way he fell. Dude, I would... I, I, was pissing my pants laughing so hard because he just went boom and, and then just went down. And oh my gosh. Even though I'm pretty sure that's not how the events go, I would like to think in my mind that 90% of this movie is true. Like I know probably 90% of the movie is made up. They got about 10% of the true story in there. Not but, even. Not even. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I do like the other thing that I thought, uh, which was my favorite, which might surprise people, 
is the clips that they splice in between because I did the the story and you did on on your channel, but I showed the newscast and it was the exact newscast I showed that was in the movie. That is an actual newscast of the events. Yeah. So I thought it was cool that they spliced the actual newscasting into Tom Brokoff or Brokoff? Yeah, the yeah. Tom Brokoff talking about it. That's like that's a that, that's Tom Brokoff. If you guys aren't old enough to remember, he was probably the last great news anchor. Um, um okay, it, that's it for another day. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably I just got for another day, but okay, we can agree he's one of the greats. And oh, certainly. Uh having that spliced and then the actual conversations about cocaine in America and things like that and the growing epidemic spliced in between your film. I thought that was some really great – and the transition too from how they show the crime scene in mm -hmm. the footage and then it transitions into the actual movie. That's great filmmaker. I don't know who did the editing and the cinematography, but that was a great transition from going into like showing the news clip and then it kind of pulls back and it pushes you into the story. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And we mentioned, we mentioned some of the uh, editing issues in Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. I think, uh, I even think the editing was one of the weaker parts uh, of the film just because of like stupid little things like that was done great, but then juxtaposed with a scene where they're like, Oh, there was a body. And then they do a quick flashback. I'm like, where did this flashback come from? This, is so, see, this okay. is so dumb. And I picked that apart because there, honestly, is, aren't too many things for me to complain about because I love the movie. So me, I think I have a little bit more than you. And we were talking about this earlier. A little bit more my, uh, as far as my issues with the film. Okay. And uh, because I know people are going to be hyped. Like, don't get me wrong. This is not to say if someone went up to me and asked me, hey, would you go see cocaine? Oh, hell yeah. I tell you in a minute. I've go. recommended it to so many people. Oh, I have ever, to. Like, like, most people have heard of it. Uh, I don't know if they're going to go through and actually see it. Uh, I hope they do. I hope yeah, at least I, people do. Dude, this is killing Ant-Man right now, so there's our answer. But uh, right. <laughs> uh, it's, so far, it's doing phenomenal. And, and really, it deserves to. But here's my problem, and I'm going to go back to the Elizabeth Banks thing and my issues with her as a director. Um, Elizabeth Banks is a great actress. I love her. Um, it has nothing to do with the fact that she might be super fucking hot, too. But anyways... Um, <laughs> you set that tone in forty-year-old virgin for sure. But. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's okay. not kid ourselves. And I'm glad that she's proving that she has some some you know directing chops, and she wrote the script too. But this is my problem with Elizabeth Banks' writing, and it shows itself in this movie, is that she likes to make subtextual comments in her movies. She likes to put subtext and she likes to have deeper metaphors for things and stuff like that. Uh, it was in another movie called. Uh, okay. Um, there was another movie she did. Uh, I forgot what it was. I'll uh, think okay. about it later. But um, and the issue is, is that sometimes she has too much going into her movies all at once instead of focusing on the main thing. Mm. And my big issue with this film is and I've counted it. Folks, if you go back through, or if you're weird like us who who do this movie thing, there is nine subplots in this movie, all concerning the main characters, and then the bear, and then there's other side stuff going on. So you have all the subplots with all the characters, then you have the drug subplot, then you have the bear subplot, and then you have then you have that cop subplot plot, that's plot of uh, integrating with the with the uh, with the drug lord dealers. subplot so so they integrate and then you have this this other plot going the mother on daughter with the mother and daughter but and then, then you, you have, have the daughter and the friend but then you have the friend who has to get to the mom and then the mom and the the little boy the friend of the daughter and there's these park rangers too there's which I, I i mean my goodness and then uh, you have the three gang members who are related to the park ranger you see what i'm saying it's doing so much and, and i still felt little like, time at, with little time and i felt like when you really think about it not all of the subplots really come together either coherently or make a whole lot of sense like if you, oh, you oh, cut out 
I think it makes sense. It just, you know, it, it's done in a very short amount of time. So we, we don't know necessarily who to root for. Uh, yeah. Like what are we rooting for the bear for some of them? Yes. Uh, you know, for some of the characters when it's them versus the bear. Absolutely. But I mean, like when you come to like, you know, uh, I think it's Ice Cube's kid and old and Aaron Reich. Uh, I actually like at first I thought, you know, introducing old and Aaron Reich, which by the way, I did not know who the cast was before going into this film. So I was very surprised, <laughs> but uh, you know, I thought that was a little slow. That scene in the bar was drawn out a little bit, but it, it's all important, but it's just done in a way that just, it, it felt like that first act kind of dragged a little bit. And there are some times where like, okay, the bear is with the kids now. I'm really worried about that. But no, we have to cut to these other stories. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Focus on the bear. That's important. Focus on the bear. And that, and it worked out fine, that but is still. my, that, and you hit the nail on the head. For me, the, and this is an, a large issue. And she has this issue in other films that she's either directed or wrote for, is that yeah, sometimes. She, she did not write this film. This um, but it, I think she co-wrote right. herself. She does have a credit for it. Um, oh, okay. But uh, I do think at times, and even if we say directing, because then we, like you said, there was that weird shot that someone messed up on, and I looked it up. They actually were supposed to have that originally in the film, but the, and I don't blame it on her. That was the editing department. They messed up and didn't put the scene in the right place. But anyways, um, it's and it's little things like that in her directing. It's like. You have you build this tension, right? And the thing that takes attention immediately out of the scene is when we're following the kids and we're like, oh, it's going to happen. And then we hard cut to something like completely unrelated and it's boring. So you had all of this suspense built and then you immediately kill it with going to other characters we don't care about. Yeah. yeah and, and then, we're yeah, it goes from like those kids and then like, OK, now we're walking. And talking about like 20, 20 questions or something like that. I'm like, why? Why? I don't remember exactly what it was. But yeah, it, it, it just kills the vibe because like we are on the edge of our seats right now. And then like, oh, just kidding. Uh, like, ah, oh, come on. And the other thing that pissed me off too was that with that one girl, right? They find her in the cave. She has the the bites or whatever. On, she all this paint, on, which is like, how, how did you carry all that paint? I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah, the, but the other issue I had was she had like an injury. Remember, she could hardly walk because I, I gathered the bear dragged her to the cave or whatever. But the thing is, they don't show it or they don't even show the hint of it. We're just after that hard cut, the kids all the way over in a tree when we get finally get back to them and the daughter's missing. That's very jarring because, yes, you can leave stuff to people's imagination to kind of build it up. But you got to give them something to make the connection. And I was confused mm -hmm. for a second to like, where's the daughter? Did the bear eat the daughter? Did the bear drag her off? And it just hard cut to the kid being in the tree. So I'm like, it feels like within that span, we're missing a scene somewhere. Like something right. was directly cut out. <laughs> and we just jump cut. Now the kid's in the tree. And it's little like editing things like that. That kind of took me out of the movie. And I had to get my bearings back and kind of figure out where everyone was. And this is not to be like, like, folks, keep in mind, our job here is we're nitpicking and breaking it down. So the average person probably won't notice these things. But when you review as much as we do and you watch as much as we do, you notice these things. And mm -hmm. it takes you out of the movie, even if you can't articulate why you jumped out of your frame of mind. You right. will be like, whoa, wait, what happened? And it confuses the audience, and then they got to catch back up. And worst of all, you lost the tension of the scene because you went from a bear staring at them, blowing like coke out of his nose, to – yeah, which was great. Like I said, we were like, oh, shit, the bear's going to kill kids. We haven't seen this in years. Like, them kids are going to get – and then, bam, hard cut. And it's like, what? What? No, go back to the bear. Go. What happened? What? Ha How did he get in the tree? And that's what I was thinking. I'm like, I was so confused, and it's jarring. And this is my problem with some of her directing is that the scenes can be really rough, and it sure. kills any tension you have in that moment. Mm. Yeah. And that's not good for this kind of movie. N definitely not. Uh, you were. Uh... 
you, I agree with uh, how w when you said that there feels like a scene missing. That that's something that that I thought right? in the back I'm not of my crazy. mind. I don't I don't think so. Um, the only thing I could think of is that maybe they filmed that scene, but it did, just didn't work. Like it, it's terrible. Okay, fine. But if this is the best you can do, cool. But like, there's there's evidence to believe that there there were some mistakes that were made, or like there's there were ways that could have been done a lot better that just were not done. And so you got what you got. And th they filmed this a while ago. And you know, by the way, uh, but the only the only excuse really is just like the kids grow up. And stuff you can't really do too much with reshoots like now with them uh and also with ray liotta um can we talk about him for a second this was one of uh, the last movies that he was in not the last to be released but i think maybe one it is one of the last that he partook in and if nobody if for people who don't know uh ray liotta was uh, the lead in goodfellas um that's just one example um and many, many great films. And in many, he's delivered many great performances. Uh, he passed away about a year ago. Um, but fortunately, they filmed all, all of his scenes. He's like the lead drug lord. And um, I, I, don't, I don't know how you feel uh, about this being one of his last films. I, I, I thought it was great. I think he did just fine. Played it just, he played his role very well. Just knew how to do it. And uh, man, what a privilege that must have been for everyone on set to be acting alongside him and uh, Elizabeth thanks to direct him. Uh, but I, 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 I think he did a good job, but I also felt that it was sort of, um, I'm like, well, man, that, that was it. That was the last time we get to, one of the last times we get to see him on screen. It's great, but it also, it just kind of, it sucks. I don't know if that's because of the loss of Ray Liotta or because the way things turned out in the film. Look, I, I got to say, for me, I'm hoping this is his last movie. And, and I'll explain by reason is that I think this is a great note to go out, out on. One, this movie's doing extremely well in the box office. And two, um, you could tell he's kind of older. You know, he's, he's kind of getting up there. But for what? the role acts uh, acts of him and and what the writing is i think some of the way he delivers his lines he be, he's even got his own set of jokes and for me they landed i was laughing when he was talking about the kid like he's got this thing where he's looking after his son's kids and he just says the most horrendous stuff ever and the way he <laughs> delivers his lines had me laughing my ass off where he's like this fucking kid in these balls <laughs> when he was in the ball pit i, I was just like I was dying because uh, it's like you left him life. alone. Like, yeah, well, you left him with me. What did you expect? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you got, you, he's like, you left him alone in San Francisco. He goes, yeah. <laughs> like, hey, it was, it, it, it was, it was, it was almost like, hey, it's me. And, like, <laughs> and, and the interesting part about him is he is a bad, uh, kind of a bastard in this movie. But at least in the beginning, until you get to the very end. And even then, I, I couldn't really hate him, although I was satisfied with the karmic justice he got. But Spoiler alert, get... he got mauled by the bear, which is exactly what we wanted to see. Uh, 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 however, well, I, I think that could have been done a little bit better, a little bit more gruesome. It took a while. Like, we were anticipating it. Oh, that's another thing. Uh, oh, man. I, I didn't even think about this. Because it, that scene when they're on the cliff and they jump into the river, it, it's kind of drawn out. His focus is on the cocaine. It just takes too long for the bear to get him, you know, especially when he's kicking the cubs. I'm like, OK, 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 let's just get to the part. Yeah, that's where that's where uh, he went full hate. But I uh, back to what I was saying with yeah. Ray Liotta, this is how and, and this is why I would like this to be his last film, because he in this ridiculous movie with a ridiculous premise mm -hmm. he did something that only he could do as an actor he made you like him even though he's a scumbag in the beginning and then at the in the very same movie he made you hate him all mm -hmm. in in that thing and that's a great actor like in the beginning i don't think anybody can argue like 
most people will like him. But then when you get to that scene and you see what he does and then you actually see what he's like as a father, he makes you hate him in the same breath. And I think that really speaks to how great of an actor he is. Because look about Goodfellas. He did the same exact thing in that. Mm -hmm. Like his character, Henry is so likable but you get to a transition in the film where you hate him and then he switches it back to where he goes into witness protection and you right. like him again so he has this thing that very few actors have where he could be the most hated or liked person all in the same movie it hell in the same scene he can make you hate him one scene and then love him the next yeah, and, like, and that's and that's difficult to do. Like, don't don't oh, be yeah. wrong. It, it's very difficult. There have been, uh, you know, um, you know, when I was in high school doing plays, like, I, I I played a role where like I was the most likable one, or at least supposed to be. Uh, <laughs> but uh, then there were times where I was easily the most hated. Uh, the best reception I got was a show for children, and you know, when and I was like a bully, and when my character got, you know got uh my uh, uh got his comeuppance uh all, all the children in the theater like were clapping like and i was like yes i did i did something right i did something right i was like thank goodness thank goodness um, and people think that fun. playing a villain fun. or or a good guy is easy and it's not because you can go too good or you could go too evil to where you're comical but playing a role where you're a bad guy and you have nuance is not easy to do. And that really no. shows how seasoned he is. Like there's a lot of, and that's one thing I will give him credit for, even though I think there's too many people in this and you could have scaled down some of the people we've seen in the subplots from her killing. I do respect that every character has a lot more to them than you initially think. And every character has a joke and at least one of the jokes land somewhere. There's a lot of characters, there's a lot of, like, humor in the movie, very dark humor, but it's there. And I can guarantee you, at least one character in this movie will have you laughing your ass off about something. Yeah, like, when, it, when it's the cop, you know, and his little poodle. Or oh, God, I was, la I was laughing so hard. I'm like, I get you, bro. I understand. I have a, I, I, I have like, a rabbit, so. I, I, think he was one of my, I think he was one of my favorites. Uh favorite characters when he's standing on top of the gazebo that whole time he's like oh, i just climbed up a tree and i just jumped onto it i'm like what 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 <laughs> like and, and I, I, I was confused by that but it worked because of his delivery it was so believable that yeah, i just like, i just that doesn't that does not even make a, a shred of sense but like we said and I think this is the main issue with when he, the poo blood and honey, right? Mm -hmm. The difference between this, the absurd scenes in this movie work because the actors are able to pull it off convincingly. So like I was saying about that Winnie the Pooh, you if you're going to have things that don't work and that are kind of off, then you need the actors to offset that. And it's not saying that works for every film. But ninety percent. Some of lines the time, are very difficult to deliver. Do, yeah, seriously. sometimes like, even if a great you're trying actor. To, yeah, if you're trying to be serious with, like, if you get a script like The Room, to do it convincingly, it's just no, no. I, I mean, I, hey, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, uh, Tommy's my boy. You keep living the dream, buddy. Like, I agree. I, uh, you you keep you keep you keep i i always waited for him to do something else i'll be completely honest with you <laughs> but if it's a one and done good for him um but no i think that yeah like you said not to rub it only, in but <laughs> <laughs> anyway you could you, yeah uh the legend right there uh you could say that um even wait great actors so like here's an example and not to come back to disney but you know i think it all fits uh, take Thor, for instance, Love and Thunder, right? You have the great, and I will die on this hill, you have the great Christian Bale, right? And that's a situation where, like we said, sometimes the greatness of the actor can't fix the problems because you have this man delivering and, and carrying with his performance on his back, trying his hardest. But then the issue you run into is, He's playing different than what the rest of the film is. So you have this dead serious role, and he's just killing it, chewing up the scenes with his lines. But he can't save that because the rest of the movie around him sucks, and there's nothing he can do to save it. Whereas in this one, 
this movie doesn't inherently suck. The premise is good. You could tell the writing has it has something there. So the actors are able to salvage what wouldn't actually work in any other other movie with their d- delivery. And I think that's where you have uh, the actors saving some things. Because when you think about that scene, if it was played by anybody else, everybody in the audience would be like, come on, man, there's no way this this man jumped from a tree onto that gazebo. But yeah. because he delivers it so convincingly, I'm sitting there looking on the, I'm thinking to myself, like, yeah, he could probably. Yeah, and, and I, think, <laughs> I, I think that's where I, I'm torn. Uh, because while we do spend a lot of time with all these characters and all these multiple subplots, and maybe that doesn't work uh, in terms of, Tonally, no, well, not totally, but pacing. Pacing, yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. Um, it does help establish personality, which I think supersedes uh, pacing to a certain degree, because then you have good payoffs like that. You know, I like, the- and it makes sense. And then when you have a scene like that, when you have a scene where uh, the bear uh, passes out on uh, on old Aaron Reich. <laughs> And, that and that is one of my favorite scenes. Too. It's like, oh, it's a, it's a girl. Like, how do you know it's a girl? Uh, her vagina is right by my ear, which, by the way, makes no sense. It, it doesn't for where and, the bear fell. It does. It does not make sense at all. Uh, but I know like, everybody. Why are you in trying to peel it off? It creates a lot of questions, but it's like it's funny either way because it's just it, it it's done in a in a way that it is in a panic situation. It's just like you say some nonsensical things and do nonsensical things when you're in panic mode sometimes. And when that adrenaline is pumping, because like this bear is just mold a bunch of people and it's, it's really horrifying. Um, but also, uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, just just in that scenario, it, it just works, even though it doesn't make sense. And that's uh, because it's so absurd, because it's so believable, because the audience are, are are in on the joke. You get the sense you you put that suspension of disbelief, like we're like, OK, that anatomically makes no sense. The vagina being on the chin or on, on the neck, which is where he would be. <laughs> <laughs> does not make any sense at all. But we as an audience don't care because uh, of how believable this is, the, the delivery has been. Yeah, and I think the, the thing that makes this movie really stand out is that the fact that um, the humor in this movie is not going to appeal to like uh, people, but there's so much humor in it and so many different deliveries that there, I think, is something in here for everybody. So right. no matter where your humor is, baseline wise there's going to be a joke somewhere that lands with you and that immediately pulls you in and like i was saying my my issue i had with winnie the pooh blood and honey i didn't like any of the characters well this one is the opposite because even though i felt when i stepped back and i looked at my review i felt like there were too many things going on it doesn't necessarily mean i didn't like the people and weren't invested in their uh journey through this crazy situation because everybody still made me care about their character. And half of them really didn't have, uh, I would say everybody had equal screen time. And yet you still cared. It was just some of the way it was cut and things like that uh, would take away from somebody else's arc or somebody else's scene. Yeah, We already talked cool. about like the dead body thing. That was very jarring, especially being at the end of your film. But either way, mm-hmm. like I said, these are small complaints because I don't know about you. I was still strapped in to see how it all ended, like what the big resolution was going to be. And I cared about taking that journey. And this is a two hour movie. So, oh, it, no, it's actually a, well, it's no, an hour. An hour. It's a, uh, I, I looked it up, it's 93 minutes. And then uh, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, it was 84 minutes. It okay, barely even one. qualifies for a feature. <laughs> That that one felt like three hours. Uh, it, yeah, that and that's that's the thing when it comes to pacing. That that's a big comparison between the two. Like I felt like this Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey felt longer, even though it's like about shorter. Nine or 10 minutes shorter. <laughs> I felt that it dragged on longer. Yeah, that whole time scene in the beginning slower. and going to the therapist that really brought the pace of that film like to a screeching right. halt. And it's like, I get it, but they, they even shot that scene too long. It's like, just show her there, 
get a little thing, maybe do the little flashback and then cut. But they spent way too much time just on that scene alone. Where Cocaine Bear, uh, yeah, some of the editing was jarring, but it was very quick paced. It. The reason why I said two hours was just the, for you, you said the first act. For me, it was the second act. There were just some conversations that happened that kind of dragged it out, especially that bar scene, man. That's that really in the first sl- act, yeah. In the first act, really slowed down the movie because I'm like, why are we doing this? Like, why are we focusing them getting on him there? getting mac and cheese? Why does he have the dialogue? Like, oh, what'd you get? Uh, uh, well, I got, I got this. It's really good. And he's crying and sobbing. I'm just like, okay, can we, can we fucking move on at this point? And you like, know? I thought that worked better when they were playing the song, I go, that's where you should have put that scene in there. Yeah. But they yeah. they told that, that joke like way too much. And this is the little things I'm talking Absolutely. about that annoyed me. It was like, it, it was like, okay, even the joke was kind of uh, out of place. If you would have started with the car scene and him crying, one, that would have been hilarious. Two, relatable because everybody hears a song that reminds them of someone, right? So it fits in the context of the scene. But then, you know, it's just like, oh, we're doing this joke again because you showed him earlier crying over the mac and cheese where it was less impactful. And that's just what I mean. Like little things like that. Uh, I felt like they should have tightened it up just just slightly, just a few little different choices. But I mean, honestly, if that's the complaints we got and and look, we're doing a breakdown here. So we're Mm -hmm. I'm nitpicking because I like this movie so much, but we have to be objective. You know what I mean? And yeah, I mean, I mean, like what again, you know, like I, I wanted to talk about uh, uh, especially this is why we have this is why it's called a real conversation, because like even though we, we don't entirely agree, like I I am curious like about your your issues with the second act versus the first act, because the first act for me like had more issues uh, than the second act, really, because the second act, like a lot of things like kick in. Uh, but I am curious though uh, about uh, okay okay well well going back to hold on I, I'm trying to straighten out my thoughts a little bit because um, it, it just the point being is that yes there are there are nitpicks and there are some things that we take issue with and we do enjoy the film um, and we do have to you know like the, the point of a real conversation, that's the series that, you know, this is a, a part of is that we discuss these little things. We see what works, what doesn't work. And this is the first time we're comparing two movies about bears. <laughs> and so it just felt right. And they came out around the same time. So, uh, you know, again, since this is a relatively new series that we do sporadically, like a few times a year, um, trying to figure this out is kind of like, you know, maybe what the director of Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, is now figuring out afterwards. Uh, so just, just think about it in that way. So, yeah, this is going to be a little little choppy, but hey, you know what? At the end of the day, like, we're, we're only going to get better. And hopefully, um, with uh, in the case of Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, uh, Rise, you know, d- uh, becomes a better filmmaker because of this and actually listens to criticism uh, I mean, he doesn't have to listen to all of this, but <laughs> I mean, if he does, that would be amazing, you know, but these are the kind of conversations that are actually helpful. There's a difference between just criticizing a film and just, you know, nitpicking flaws and stuff and just being mean spirited about it. And I don't think I've not gotten the sense, at least, you know, from my perspective, and I could say the same thing for you, Zod, that we're not coming uh, from a mean spirited uh, point of view. No, for any of these, because to be quite honest, I I did not take as much issue with Winnie the Pooh, Blood and the Honey that you did. And, oh, I, you know, I took issue with so many things. Uh, but I will yeah. say to that <laughs> film's credit, there were some things that I enjoyed, whether they were unintentionally bad. It still, for yeah. me, got enjoyment. And if I got to give it a uh, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey a positive, some of that was so absurd. And I get what made it work was they were being so serious that when you saw something absurd, absurd, it made it that much more funnier, like that scene. And so I got to be equal here because I picked out my favorite scene in Cocaine Bear. I have to say my favorite scene in Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, 
besides that girl pointing out the obvious was the scene where they were by the pool and Piglet jumps in and has that sledgehammer. That was so unintentionally bad and funny that I got to hand it to them because him swinging that thing around and then trying the to figure out the physics of that last swing where, where he like caved her head in when he could barely move that thing. <laughs> Bro, that was dude top tier uh, B movie schlock that I loved. And I got a hand to him. I found that good. And, and the scene where they tied up the girl and ran her head over, like the CGI blood was terrible, but mm. the, the thought and don't the ever setup, do that guys don't ever do cgi that, blood very minimally that but I, i'll give it to them i mean and let's be honest with ourselves that's a pretty good kill there you don't get very unique that was kills. that was a pretty good kill um it, uh except for the cgi blood but. except for the cgi blood but then again showing the effect of the tire running over her and the eye popping out i gotta give it to them that looked pretty good if there was one scene that looked good until you got to the cgi blood the whole head exploding underneath the tire that was pretty well done for the budget they had because yeah they yes. the eye yeah. popping out and the tire actually running over her head so i, I think we got to give one... credit where credit is due well yes yes and uh, i guess to give winnie the poopal and honey a couple of positives um some of the shots the drone shots were very beautiful to look at of the hundred acre wood it's exactly oh, yeah. how i envisioned it even as a child um uh, but, uh, yeah, other than that, yeah. <laughs> and, and I, 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 I honestly, the intro, whoever uh, the did animated, that. well, the problem with that is like, yes, it's set like a tone, but it set the tone in the wrong way. Like, if uh, okay, was, just, uh, let's just take that out of there for the, the voice actor was good. The voice actor was good. The animation was good, but the tone that it set and how it was for the rest of the movie that that i mean while it was well done it, it was just it it just uh just uh, i guess it's one of those things where i just disagree with that direction entirely in that tone uh, oh, in, no no i and like and i totally that agree that setup and, and and that setup really just set the movie up for failure for 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 me no, I 100% agree, and we and we definitely are in agreement. That tone entirely uh, tanks the movie, but it still draws you in. You can't say you weren't drawn in. Like, okay, let me see what this is about when you watch that, because 90% of the responses I got when they lean towards the positive is that opening scene really got people to go, okay, you know, yeah. you got my attention. The issue is they didn't hold it. But that's a great opening. I mean, let's let's give them credit it's there. So that like, is a great way to introduce your film mm -hmm. and, it, and put people in that mindset. The problem is they don't keep you there. But had they led with that and it had been as strong as that first five minutes, I think they could have really had something here. Uh, but but I think I think also uh, Zod that it, it did it, while it did have a strong opening. It's at, at when, when we go back to the seriousness of it. I feel like they they had tried to maintain that serious tone of that strong opening, but just executed it in a way that was so poorly done. Um, you can have that opening, but then have the rest of the movie be like goofy and ridiculous. If you if you have again, I, I think it I think it I think it does come to the, the delivery of of the lines and rewritten lines entirely in some cases, but uh, it just, again, just sets that tone that I just, I, I just don't like. And I can't, I can't get over that. Uh, and I'm trying to think of a way where it could work and then have it be fun and enjoyable. But I mean, that, that opening, like uh, it just, it, it just took too long. And like this, this should have been like an hour long film, but I, I think they padded the runtime because they didn't have enough story to, to really, you know, just to, to really hit it home. Um, you could have easily written something in that would have been more interesting, but I guess, I, I don't know, man. I, again, I, I'm still conflicted. I admire the, uh, the attempt, but, 
Do you see where I'm coming from? I, I'm oh, I, I 100 percent. Uh, like, look, I am on board with 100 percent all of your reasons. We are 100 percent in agreement because I said myself going serious. And I think I said this before this movie came out too. going serious would be a mistake. So we're in agreement. But at the same time, I think that if you delivered more crappy lines like. I think the killer wrote that, but you had the actors leaned in on it. Like like you said, if they would have been on the joke, you could have did serious, but then did it clever to where the director's in on it. Like, we're playing it serious, but it's not really. Mm -hmm. Whereas the director's like, I'm playing it serious. End of line. <laughs> right. If he would have been like, no, no, guys, that's the joke, right? If he would have been like, that's yeah. the joke. We set it up seriously, but it's not if you're looking underneath. Like, if he had subtext in the writing where you could be like, oh, okay, he's just playing. This isn't really a serious movie. That's the joke. Ha ha, you got us. Like, come on, guys, this is absurd. Then, yeah, like you said, and I think even the serious opening could have worked in that because, right, you make a serious movie, but then you give subtext that we know it's not serious. Right, right. You have to discover that. Like, look at these lines. You think we're taking this seriously? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, and that's where I think it just comes down to Elizabeth Banks has more experience as a director and, and has more connections. I mean, but come on, let's not give her it. because And that's not, I know it's not Angel. a, I, I, look. I, know it's not a, <laughs> no, no, I want to hear you defend this <laughs> I, I know, no no she 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 is more experienced and, and knows more people who uh you know is connected in hollywood and knows how to make a, a better film than someone who's just uh, like a freshman you know like th that's that's objectively true it, it, charlie's angels aside i, I don't care like, like she she knows she knows how to do it better. That, that's just that's just a fact. When you have more experience, you learn more things. You make I mean, mistakes along the ways. You were the you were guy. talking about how Wes Craven went into a slump earlier. You know, like yeah, but you can you can easily come back from that. You know, like so it's not something to just write off uh, entirely because you made a bad movie. Yeah, but still, uh, the point is, and I think I can. Un I finally found uh, the clip of uh, the guy, and this is going to be the last one I, I show of this interview um, that is so fascinating uh, as to why the tone was serious. Uh, and I think you guys will be very intrigued by it. By the way, this is the interviewer, but uh, honestly, like when he's, when he's asking the question, his mic is like muted and the audio isn't there. So it's not, <laughs> you, you don't even know what he's asking, but uh, the answer is quite fascinating. This explains the serious tone of the film. There was like four key movies which um, really influenced this for me. Um, and they're almost sequential when you watch it, uh, which is purely by coincidence. But I love the first wrong turn. Like there's something really, that I, I've always been really interested in that. And I know it's not the biggest budget horror movie out there, but like I loved it. Sure. Um, so I drew a lot of inspiration from that. Then I love the strangers. I, I think you could tell that. Oh yeah. You can tell yeah. that. And then you um, and then he mentions the strangers, which is very interesting. All serious. As well. So the strangers was another film I brought a lot of um or took a lot of inspiration from, particularly mm -hmm. some of the death scenes. So um uh, all, there was... all, all three of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh god i, uh, I, I, I mean to forget pray pray at night or no no yeah yeah I, I mean well is it is it pray at night or are they referring to the i think he might be referring to the first one the first one was very well done yes don't watch the other ones you, they're a waste of time there's more than one other one like there's there's i know there's pray at night but there's a third i think there's a third or it's coming out oh okay well regardless the the kind of iconic pool death scene i wanted to replicate oh god you Not missed like a mark that, on that that oh uh, that makes that scene so much better for me <laughs> uh, <laughs> was there a pool scene in the second one uh yes okay so he drew inspiration from the sequel oh oh okay all right now now i get it now I get it, but I haven't seen that movie, so I don't know. 
have a i just wanted to pull death because i thought it looked cool and buy one of the camera going under the water a lot so uh can you explain that by the way zod like what what, what he's talking about so in the best part of the second strangers you don't need to watch anything but you can cl watch the clip on youtube i would suggest the rest of the movie is god awful but there is a really great death and it's been actually put into horror deaths and things like that it's a really great well shot scene which baffled me about the rest of the movie um but the strangers chase this couple into a large swimming pool because they're at a hotel and one of the killers gets in the pool with them. I think it's the dude with the sack over his head. And he slices his throat. But the way they do the shot is like the kid's like this over. And there's all this blood that's pooling. And it's a really great. It's really well shot. Um, and they said they used underwater cameras and stuff. Because they kind of give you a like a, a camera going up. So you could see the blood coming out. It's just really well done. So I get I get the scene he's talking about. And now what makes that scene for Poopa and Honey so much better for me is that is the complete opposite of how you shoot that scene. So <laughs> because... Oh, okay. So that's the bad version of it. But okay. So his is the very poor version and if the student do... film rep replication. Okay. Yeah, and if you're gonna do a scene like that, you've gotta have the budget because clearly he didn't have the cameras to go up underneath or to show the movement. It yeah yeah sorry okay. rise man <laughs> that's no no it, it, it that, that's fine you know again this guy's learning so it's, it's cool i introduced a lot of that into the movie then there was a lot of like texas chainsaw massacre aspects in there sure um but oh, oh with the hooks absolutely yep overall the biggest influence across the whole thing would be halloween like he was for me, when I was thinking of Winnie the Pooh, I was like, what direction do I take him? Um, do I keep him small and do I make him like Chucky? Or do I make him this big, <laughs> that would have kind worked of juggernaut me. scary um, monster? And I thought, okay, that's the route I want to take him. And that route is... I, I want to see the Chucky version. I wish he went for a smaller Pooh. That would have made this movie... This movie would have been my movie of the year. Had he have gone with the Chucky idea, dude... Does that bring your score up? Because that automatically brings it up for me. Picture Winnie the Pooh sized, just animatronic, killing people. Why did they not go with that? No, I'm just saying. Winnie... To make him look really menacing. Um, and I, I can't remember which Halloween it was, but there's one where he was on top of a car. Um, and he was holding onto the car while in mm -hmm. the side. So I've got like something similar to that as well. So that was like my main inspiration from it, really. Okay. So like, here's the thing, like Michael Myers works because he's, he's the shape, like he's got the mass, he's formless. And I do see what he's talking about. Cause there were times where we were like, where the hell did he come from? Like that scene at the end where he shoves the knife through uh, the girl's mouth and, and sticks her yeah. on the post. Like, that's cool. Visually, That's I totally see that taken as inspiration from Halloween, but it doesn't work. Yeah, because... and, but I, I do think, like, I understand, like, having, like, the shape, no pun intended, of Winnie the Pooh and uh, being, like, a tall figure. It just works more for the budget reason. But also, like, having, like, a little Chucky thing, that would have been, like, that would have cost so much money and, you know. Dude, that would have worked for me, though. You can't tell me you would have at least been amused. If it, if it would have been terribly <laughs> done, yeah. It, it, and that, and I that, mean, come I mean, on. You, you can't even, like, come on. I know you want to giggle at that concept. But there's... It's just a little... <laughs> <laughs> that that, that kind of looks like the character you know, yeah. a little bit for the cartoon I, I don't know the, the imaging yeah it would have been interesting. Uh, I, I want to see what that image would have looked like I want to see what they originally sketched just to see if someone sketched out that image what it would have looked like oh man that that would have been so fascinating um I get it, but th there's there's no way they could have pulled that off. If they couldn't pull off this, they could not have pulled off that. And, and a piglet next to him because piglet's shorter. Oh my, <laughs> oh my god, dude, we we would have had gold. This would have been my movie of the year. Uh, I want that they, cut. <laughs> if they if they pulled it off, sure. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, 
he Dude, goes the on budget a was a hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah there's movie. there's no way to have good animation with that. You you would have had to have put a hundred thousand just in you know CGI and. But and... to be fair, the original Chucky from what is it eighty seven. In the, somewhere in there, I guess there. you could have done that, but you could have done it. The only, the most expensive part of that movie is Brad Dorf, and I don't even think he was paid what he would be paid now, or what he's paid now to do the voice of Chucky. So if you put it into that perspective, it's not that difficult to do. They still did a really good, believable doll with pr- probably today's standards a way less budget than even what these guys got because that first Chucky movie if I remember correctly, does not have that big of a budget. I mean... It, it, it's probably more than 100000 I I'd say it's more than 100000 but, I mean, still. Um, I don't think in movie standards it's a lot. Well, yeah, I mean, it's definitely not a lot, but you have to take into account... Um, you know, Oh, it was uh, between 9 and $13 million. Yeah, so I'd say... No, it's, it's low budget, but... This this guy is like doing this out of pocket, so and relying on funds. So yeah, I don't know, I'd be really intrigued because I would say you could get animatronics and, and stuff. That would be probably the most expensive part of doing that. But I mean, even if you look at Sam Raimi doing Evil Dead, the original, there were a lot of animatronics then, and they had a shoestring budget. I want to say their budget is actually really lower than again? these guys. Uh, Evil Dead. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, Evil Dead. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think they had somewhere in that neighborhood because Sam Raimi did that movie basically out of pocket. And look at all the special effects and prosthetics and stuff he did in that. I want to say there's a way you could do it. I would 100% think there has to be a way you could do it. I mean, they had 2.7. Uh, no, yeah, they had 375000 But that's yeah, in so 1981 it, money or nineteen. 19- 80 money early 1980s so it's still like adjusted for inflation a lot more but that's yeah that, that would have been impossible to do is what i'm trying to say you i mean have you done have, it, but it to have, have well. a friend who's good with that and then get them and be like hey we could make this have them do it for free uh, maybe <laughs> get a percentage of the profits if it does well but that's not not gonna encourage like a professional to really go into this yeah, see, and, and the time, yeah, I don't want to get too far off track, but you're right. But, I mean, but, yeah, I mean, like, I get it, and uh, the intention clearly by the scenes he's stating and me thinking about the movie now, it makes sense to the di- direction. It's just the wrong yeah. direction where Cocaine Bear knew what it was, and it leaned heavily into that, and they clearly spent the budget where they needed to to get the effect the kills were great the bears kind of iffy sometimes it looks good sometimes it's very uncanny most of the time it it just it just kind of works especially when the bear has personality and what works for the bear is that it does have uh you know like the bear is not like the antagonist like clearly like ray Liotta is the antagonist so i I mean mean, because it's just a bear it's it's the the bears kind of just like if you were to say uh, in these movies like Twister or something, the tornado is an antagonist. It's not really. It's just the external Tornado. force. Yeah. yeah. Where yeah. that's what the bear is. It's just the external force outside of these people's controls. The real villain is Ray Liotta. I think the hero is Carrie the mother. Russell? Yeah, the mother, um, and I would say, is that. Maybe uh, O'Shea Jackson and Old Nairike. Are like heroes in their own way, but like what it just because there's not like a solid main character, it's hard to really pinpoint that. But sometimes it works in movies where you don't have just like one person that you root for, like, but there usually is like this is this is the main character. I think that's supposed to be Carrie Russell or Carrie Russell. Um, I, but there, but she isn't... gets so overshadowed, and that's my other issue. Now that we're getting into it with this movie, is that I do feel a sense like she was supposed to be the main focal point because in these movies, what do you always have? The mother, the person, like, and the way they pick out her story in particular: single mother trying to raise her kid. She's uh, a nurse. 
yeah, it, she can't go to this waterfall thing. It, it, it That's my issue when I said that things get pulled away from in this movie. You know, to get to being fair to each movie, right? My Nick picks is with that. Like, like, yeah, you have this perfect, like, archetype set up. And clearly, by the way the movie presents it, she appears to be the person we're going to be rooting for. But then, I don't know about you, it kind of feels like her story gets pushed to the side until, like, the end of the movie. Right. And yeah. it's weird if that's the person we're supposed to because be rooting for. Right. Uh, and... You know, it's supposed to be about that. We don't see, like, whoever she's going to go on a date with. Like, oh, it's some guy, you know, whatever. Um, we don't get much into her either. It's like she's a nurse. That yeah, and all she is is trying to find her kids. And, yeah, she's a nurse. And what else do we know about her? Like, she's dating around. Like, she, she's dating, which is, like, normal for a single parent. And her well, kid is rebellious. So, like, Because of not... how she's raised. And, yeah, yeah. It's, so it's like it's like they started the bare bones and it felt like they initially said, OK, this is the person we're going to be following. But then they got all these other people and they're like, well, we've and got she Ray gets top, we've got. Yeah. And she gets top building. Yeah. So that's even weirder because, OK, OK, clearly this was supposed to be your lead. But in this movie, we don't follow the lead until the end. It's a very weird choice. And that's what I wanted to point out. Yes, we go harder on Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Uh, not in a not in a bashing way or bashing the guy directly. Don't be I, like I, that. I don't I don't think so. Don't definitely don't call the cops. Yeah, don't call the cops. <laughs> don't, don't don't guy. be that person on the internet, yeah. please. Don't don't be yeah. that. Nobody likes that person. But I mean yeah. we, we do go hard, but let's let's lay out the things with cocaine bear because there is some negatives, and one of them is is definitely sometimes the structure of the writing is off. And we gave examples. There's literally examples in the movies. Like, this isn't a flawless movie. There are clear eras, like actual eras in this film. There are we eras. Pointed, uh, yeah. I know you meant to say errors. But <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, well, but that does lead me to, uh, to say that there's one more critique that I had was that they always, at the bottom of the screen, they show the location way too oh, many yeah. times. And I'm like... Do we need to know this? Do we and need they to know hung if they on it. In Tennessee or Georgia? Like, I don't care. I don't care. Just, just play the movie. Play the movie. We don't need to know like, where it no, takes you place. Can... Like a couple of times, fine. But after that, let's move on. No, no, if we I follow the characters, you... we'll know where they are. No, no. I think what you mean is, is that, uh, and how Justin's framing it is, they'll show you a character and give you where they are cut to the other character and give you where they're they are it's but they're in the same place so why are you doing double like subtitling when that character is clearly where the other characters are and we don't need a screen or telling were. us the location like if yeah. they show up at the pavilion and we've already seen the subtitle from the other character like a couple of minutes ago then you don't need to re-subtitle it because it kind of treats your audience like they're stupid and they forgot the location Within the five minutes, you cut back and forth. Like, like we have a greater attention span than than you think. We're we're sitting here watching a ninety minute movie in a theater, not looking at our phones. We're there for a reason, you know. You don't have to keep constantly trying to get our attention because we're in the theater, and that's we're where already I there. Get, that's where I will give Pooh, Blood and Honey, and independent directors credit. Um, so they don't do that. They, they, <laughs> No, they haven't had that outside influence, and and this is an issue we talk about if you see our reviews. Hollywood has this thing, and especially well-known directors have this thing of feeling like the audience they're talking to are a bunch of idiots, and you'll see it. It doesn't matter what movie you watch. There's always something somewhere where if it's a seasoned director, they just get this in their mindset that like their audience either can't focus or doesn't have the attention span. And they, they spoon feed you certain things. And that annoys me because it's like, I'm not a child. This is an R-rated movie. I'm going to assume kids are not in here. So you're you're catering to adults. You don't need to treat us like we're idiots by showing us the place we've been spent the majority of the movie in 50 times. It's like, I get it. It's in Tennessee. Like, even if someone's driving, like, these people all come from different places, right, to this one spot. But even Tennessee if, or Georgia, and that's it, and you don't have to go back and forth between. Yeah. The, the, it's okay. It's okay. Like, at the beginning, like, a couple of times, like, maybe, like, three 
times maximum. And then, you know, you establish the location and then that's it. All right. Yeah, people get it. We'll, yeah. Well, and then we, we get, understand. and then we get it because we're familiar with the location. <laughs> we know where it is. All right. So when you cut back and forth later, you, you get it. You get where we're taking place. I, I'm, so, I'm sorry. We've been harping on like uh, on this for five minutes or something like that, but like, no, but it's it, true because it is yeah. it's annoying. It's, and, and yeah. I think we both are angry about it because how many movies have I'm not we angry, had? But uh, well, it angers me annoying. because uh, how many movies have we sat through where, uh, and this just isn't a knock on this movie, like any of these big budget movies where they treat you like you're an idiot, like they say things or they have my biggest pet peeve. They have the character say everything that just happened in the film. Have you ever been sitting there? Marvel's famous for this, where you've seen the scene and a character literally explains to another character what just happened five minutes ago. And they're like, oh, yeah, well, I was just fighting this guy in this realm. This happened. And it's like. And they do it seriously it? as opposed to like a joke. It's just like, OK, I think we get it. Like, it, you know, like that it. that's where that's where Robert Downey Jr. worked as Iron Man. Just like being like, yeah, yeah, we we know. We know. Yeah. We, like, we already got it covered. Yeah. yeah like we, we are aware. Yeah, and is speaking in a way for the audience. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, it's so, like dialogue delivered just purely to make sure people are paying attention e even though you played the scene and you have the context yeah. they tell it to you and it's like no you don't need to i'm an adult i get it i got it when you showed me the scene you it didn't is have different to play though it, back. it is different though when when you're talking about marvel though because that's also geared towards kids so i mean but we don't we shouldn't at the same time hold that to a different standard because it's just it's a movie we're judging it based on how we see it you know, and, and to dumb down uh, the audience, like it, when, when there's kids involved too, like you know. And I don't believe. Is, and let's be real, kids is not as stupid kids, as kids are not is. that dumb. Yeah, like it, it's like there's a thing where ex explanation is one thing, but like treating your audience like they're dumb is a completely different other thing. And I mean, to Cocaine Bear's credit, there is some subtext stuff in here. Uh, but it's some, like some is left to the imagination, some to, the, to the humor, uh, to the humor. Of the story, like the gazebo. How'd he get up there? He just said it. And that was great. That's fine. <laughs> but I think what this comes down to, it's just it's just balance. Um, and while while you have I feel like you have a little bit more critiques on cocaine bear than I do. I loved this movie. Otherwise, oh, don't get me wrong. I love it, too. I, yeah. I, otherwise, I would least, not have. Yeah, I would not have driven down to Lexington, uh, Kentucky, to actually see the cocaine bear. By the way, I have a funny story about that, which I think um, I'll end on um, after we uh, you know talk about because we are getting you know it, it's almost the two hour mark. So, um, so the question is, who did it better? We know the obvious answer, <laughs> but I think the question should be, what can you do better? Or, or how, how, how can, how can, uh, like, a, I hate to say student film, like, how, how can young filmmakers, you know, wh what can they learn? Uh, and what can this young director learn from Cocaine Bear that they, and I want to pose that question done? too to Cocaine yeah. Bear, because I think if we're keeping it balanced, we should definitely talk about to what Cocaine Bear could have did better as well and learn from because, uh, Elizabeth Bank did come out and say she wants to do like a cocaine shark. I, totally I think that were, there that. were talks about it because there was a story of uh, you know a bunch of cocaine in the middle of the ocean. Dude, That'd be kind of totally cool, but a shark that. movie that's something else. Like just just you know you're going to be compared to Jaws. Good luck, good luck, Liz. And the reef <laughs> and uh, forty six meters and every other shark movie. That's and the Meg and, it, and the, yeah, just, just be careful, be careful. <laughs> that's a slippery slope, but. Uh, yeah, I think we should pose that question to both of them because well, well, sure, I sure. like the movie, but this isn't a perfect 10 out of 10. I mean, for me, I'd even say maybe I'd rate it an 8. I wouldn't even go 9 or 10, at least for my personal uh, right. thing. Uh, yeah, I would put this a as a solid 8. It's enjoyable. It gets your attention. Hell, this is on my TV or, or it comes to like HBO or something. I'll, I'll put it on. I'll watch it again. I'll watch it several times. 
there's a lot of scenes that I love in this film. A lot of humor that I love. Uh, Winnie the Pooh, we will never watch again. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cute. You should get it. Uh, yeah, but uh, I guess like I guess... me and Vichy were talking about it. She's like standing yeah. along the side, and we both agree. Like we would never watch this again. We probably wouldn't have seen this I'm sober. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's a perfect summary. Uh, uh, like I, if we were drunk or high, would we like? So there you go. The, the, well, the well, well, well uh, 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 on that note, though, uh, I, I will say, like, this does seem like we're comparing apples to oranges. Somebody who's more experienced and has a budget and has the actors versus somebody who doesn't. Uh, but. Uh, and it may seem like it's unfair, like an unfair comparison. And to a certain degree, it is uh, very unfair. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge that. But at the same time, we're reviewing movies as they are. And that's that's just our opinion. You know, so it, it doesn't necessarily matter the backstory, although it should be taken into account the behind the scenes stuff. It should also be taken into account, like, how do these movies hold on their own? And that's how they should be viewed. On their own. The final oh, product. 100%. That's what matters. That's what a lot of people will come out of and say about the movie that they just saw. And what they paid for. <laughs> you know? Like, oh, you know, and that's, and that's one of those things where, uh, I mean, it sucks to have to try to compare that. But they're two movies about bears. Like and killing people, so like it, it's just and, and there are two movies that I I think where we could do the comparisons is there are two movies that do absurd concepts, but mm -hmm. it's a great example of one that didn't do what the other did, and why the other one succeeds versus the one at least to us, because like we said at the top of this stream and our our biggest critique is that and, and you know you posed the question so. Here's my constructive criticism to this director. Man, lean into the absurdity of your concept. The main issue that everybody's going to have and we have as reviewers, and, and I've heard this from objective reviews of this movie. You had a great concept, and there's people defending this saying, oh, they meant to direct it as like a B movie. And it's like, no, you guys are wrong. Stop trying to defend this with a stupid excuse because – no, the director has clearly said that that wasn't what they were going for. So you can't even say they were trying to do a B movie and that we're taking it too serious. No, when you present me with a serious movie, I'm going to judge it, like you said, on the merits of the film. If you mm -hmm. are setting a tone – and Justin, this is to your point, which is why I can't argue with you on this. If right from the beginning you set a serious tone, then for better or worse, you've locked yourself into that. And, and yeah. we tried to workshop it, and, and there was no way. The only way you could salvage it is to make it serious, but kind of nod at the audience, like, "Yeah, I, this is presented this way on purpose." Yeah, and, I, and what it. they could have done in that opening sequence that was uh, really well done for a lot of people, uh, that uh, hand drawn thing, you could have had like a a funny little cartoon of like uh, Eeyore getting eaten, because of course the depressed guy is the one who's going to go first. Yeah, yeah, you know, just like. like you know, like you could have, you could have artistically illustrated, literally, how how absurd the movie can be. That like we're gonna try to play it somewhat serious, but we're also gonna have fun with it. That's a tone that can be set. Yeah, like so, the, that's and the we didn't see no any fun. of that. We didn't hear anything about owl or rabbit <laughs> or tigger. That uh, was well, a tig missed tigger, opportunity. Tigger is still um, it, under Disney. Uh, so Tigger is not included for that reason, because it's still protected by Disney. Thank goodness. Uh, but uh, yeah. yeah, I would have loved like a Coke out Tigger. Could you imagine how hilarious? Like, see, there's your opportunity. You can do like just a wacky killer. Like he's just. Oh, yeah. Bouncing around uh, and like okay. bouncing, bouncing on people's heads. Yeah, that would have made that like curb that. stomp a lot easier to do. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Having the tail bounce on it. Oh, oh my God. like a pogo stick. Uh, but but no, like for for I, I guess uh, you know copyright reasons that, that can't happen. But regardless, but yeah, like but like I was saying, the 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 thing that faults is like 
from the beginning and and once again mm-hmm. it's like you said season director versus not so season director from the beginning though they let you know what you're in for when that guy bonks his head and falls off of the plane and you know the story it makes it hilarious because you know that's not what happened whatsoever but now i'm in my mind going but god i hope I wish this is part of the true story. Because I wish that was. Yeah. Yeah. It was so absurd. And that kind of opening right there set a tone that the movie very smartly doesn't deviate. It doesn't go to anything serious. Even where they're at the crime scene, there's jokes in between, between the cop. Mm-hmm. And then he's got the dog in there in the box while he's at this crime scene, right? They're not trying. To... I've only had it for a day. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was the wrong dog. <laughs> And then, and then they bring it around to when he's dying. Remember it, and his flashback is him holding the dog like this, and everyone accepting it. It happened like three days ago. <laughs> <laughs> like, see, that is where, that's what we're saying, Rise. If you ever come across this, and you say, "Hey, man, we're trying to help. Like, if you want to to kick this into the next level." It, Satirically, as as he mentioned in that. Interview. Yeah, yeah. Take this to critiques. And use that in your sequel and go, okay, this tone didn't work. So now you go crazy with it, right? If you're going to go into it, then you lean into it and and you go just crazy. Like do Christopher Robin's revenge and like have them because Christopher Robin lived at the end. Like have them in an absurd duel with each other. You know what I mean? Like them hunting each other down, right? If you Don't make play... that mistake of killing off Christopher Robin at the beginning, because like no. if you leave it where it left off, if you pick up there, which yeah. Don't kill him do. immediately in the beginning. Even how don't do that. Bit. Don't do that. Yeah, please ha- have that actor return. Make it like a vendetta thing. Hey, you can have another group, but have this crazy Christopher Robin come in and be kind of like jaded and be like, "I seen yours, man." You know, play up how crazy. The concept is, and I think you could make a sequel that people go, you know what? That first one sucked, but man, number two, now that's what I came to see with one. Why didn't you do this in one? Make people question like, okay, this director has something. They they get it. Like, oh, everyone has their first film. You were just learning, right? And that's why I'm not going to come down on this movie that hard. You're just getting getting into it. So now take these comments and critiques that you get and use it to throw it back in their face. As far as Cocaine Bear goes, Elizabeth Banks, my one thing to you is, please, for the love of God, have some focus in your movies. I'm sorry, like, you don't need, if you can get an actor, that doesn't mean they need to be there. Like, uh, Ray right, Liotta well, was good. Like, no, let's be real. It felt like she could get these people, and certain people were written in because she got them to come aboard this movie. Some of those- They were invested by it. Yeah, they were they were like, yeah, I want to do Cocaine Bear. And are you going to say no to Ray Liotta? Are you going to say no to Margie, Margot, uh, I always get her last name messed up. Margot the, Robbie? She's not even no, in the movie. No, uh, her name is, uh, the. she's a very famous character actor. Um, uh, uh, is it, who is it in the movie? The park ranger. Oh, oh, who was she? Uh, I don't, I don't remember. Oh, uh, uh, oh. Margot, uh. Martindale. (laughs) Yes, Margot Martindale. Margot Martindale is very good. You could tell by her comedic value. But just because you can get her doesn't mean you can force in scenes and and undercut your movie. And this is my issue with Cocaine Bear. If there's something for this film to learn is that just because you can have someone, just because you can have these great actors doesn't mean you need them. You don't sacrifice your story and your pacing. Right, and you don't need to have them overstay their welcome. Like the yeah, whole smoking a cameo thing, been fine. like didn't didn't really do anything for me. I'm like, okay, she's trying to hide the fact that she's smoking. Like, I don't care about that in the movie the, for the purpose of the movie. She's going on a date. She doesn't want to smell like cigarettes. She's like a hypocrite, you know, in that way. Like, yeah, like that's 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 cool. But do you really need it in this movie to have more substance? Where it, a movie does not really present itself to need more substance of character. It's cool to see, but do you ultimately need it? No. Or, so, or so like it's we just talked about stuff. The, the scene with the pasta, right? In the, in the bar. Does yeah. that scene add anything? Does it 
give us anything we couldn't get from literally um, a scene five minutes later? Well, no. it, the only thing that uh, does uh, help was that uh, there was uh, uh, the cop, you know, that guy who's on the gazebo. But they flashed later. back to it. Uh, you no, no. Shown, it, yeah. You, you Did they flash shown back that to flashback. it? Yeah. They that, they that there was a guy back. listening? Yeah. They, uh, that was a flashback. Well, you could have you could have done that and have the guy like listening, and you didn't need the flashback. So, yeah. like, there are so many different options that could have made it better, and you just have to play around with it. And if this was the best that they could do, so be it. But um, I don't. But I refuse to believe. I just think there were just eras where they thought it worked, and it, and it didn't. Uh, like that one with the woods in the in the body. That felt like someone was looking over and they go, yeah. Hey, we didn't uh we didn't put yeah. the body down yeah uh, and, and i would say i would say with cocaine bear i guess the lessons to learn are just like there are little things that you could fix up we know that liz <laughs> if i may call you that you are oh, a professional you made a very good film that i very much enjoyed it's not without its flaws and you can always improve and do better and uh i i do think that it was obviously the better of the two uh and it was one of the most entertaining films i've seen in a long time oh yeah but don't get still, me wrong. but but it but still great. but still you know it's it's not without some nitpicking flaws so just keep that in mind i, I just... mean obviously out of the two of us i found a little bit more but see here's my thing though i could still have more issues that may people may call subjective right Sure. They're my own it's personal biases and all criticism is, but some of it is glaring flaws that could have been addressed too. But uh, ab this, absolutely. But this does not take away in any way the quality of the film because at yeah, the end overall, of the day, because we, we have to look at it from like, uh, like the Gene Siskel perspective of like, we don't have to, but uh, of like nitpicking little things, what works and what doesn't work. And then, uh, Roger Ebert views it as the whole picture, which is why those two balanced each other very well. Um, you know, and as a whole, Cocaine Bear is a very, a very well-made film uh, and has very talented actors and had the privilege of having a higher budget than Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Now, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, while it was an awful film, I, I initially gave it a zero out of 10. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't I'll, put it out zero. Like, uh, uh, would be zero I'll, I'll give it like a one, maybe, but yeah, like or a two, but yeah, it was not good. I, I mean, for me, this would be um, because I was solely entertained. Right, I'd give it a, uh, I give it like a four point five. I, I, like, I, I, I think you're being too generous, but uh, like, you know, uh, like, but the the thing is though, like, uh, and I understand uh, your you know, reasoning behind it. But I do think that seriously though, um, this, this is more of just, as I said before, just, it, it takes a lot to, to put something out there and put your heart and soul into it. And when you make like the wrong choice, it can be devastating for a film and the final product and it's subject to criticism. The thing is, you know, he was getting death threats, you know, and someone threatened to call the police, <laughs> which is ridiculous f for merely just having the idea be out there and the poster be out there and uh, screenshots of uh, in frames of the film being released. Uh, that was before actually seeing the movie. See, we gave this movie a chance. We were like, we, we hoped that it was going to be one way. And then when we got something else, we were disappointed. So we support... I can, I feel like I can speak for you, Zod, as well. Um, you know, we support the idea of just putting yourself out there, and the fact that you got this made is an accomplishment within itself. However, going forward, because you are very young and you are still, you know, you you have so much potential, and your intentions uh, with films may be good, but may also be flawed. Uh, you, there's a lot. I feel like if you take the right steps and take the right notes from the criticisms that either we made or other people have made, um, by the way, I would love if he's watching, I would love to talk to him one day. That would be amazing. 
maybe oh like yeah i a, would definitely love to have a conversation I'll, I'll, and I'll, I'll buy him a pint of guinness like that that is a promise <laughs> if i ever meet him uh i know he's in the uk so uh but <laughs> uh but uh i, I do think that there are every nearly every director unless you're like tarantino like in it's a miracle. Like you start off kind of oh, rough. Just, that man was just a god godsend. Like, uh, well, that, that's that's something else. But like most directors start out with movies that aren't that great. But at least you have something to prove that you can make something happen, and that's going to lead you very far. And it's it's going to be a very interesting journey to see what you do with Bambi, which I'm not as interested in as Peter Pan, which is a movie that you can take seriously. But again, you shouldn't follow that up with with Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey because it's just going to be like, okay, you're taking these seats too seriously. Um, just play up the satire a little bit more. Hire hire actors who are, are able to play this a little better, um, and just do what you can to try to really sell this. And if you are able to, if you are having conversations with studios to get a bigger budget. Please do that because I feel like the, the please, please, uh, because that will that will th th that will do you a lot of favors. You've already taken steps in the right direction. And I hope that in the future that when you make uh, more movies and I hope you continue to make movies uh, that you find some sort of success and more satisfaction. Yeah, I, and I a hundred, I a hundred percent agree with Justin on everything that he said, and and everything we've said leading up to this point. Um, whether or not I got slightly more enjoyment or whatever else, objectively, we both agree what the superior movie is. And you know, at the end of the day, it's just like you now got the outline. And look, sometimes the blueprint can start off bad, but then you come up with something great. I mean, uh, one of uh, me and Justin can both agree. One of our favorite sla slashers is Friday the 13th. Not sure. the greatest of starts. No, um, the, the, the sequels are a lot, but some of the sequels are a lot better, a lot better, especially yeah. the final chapter was, it, was, was probably top tier. In the and, and, and that's an example of, okay, we've got a concept. Where can we take it? And if you could do that, then in, in a couple of years, people won't even remember the original, but you well, they will, but <laughs> <laughs> or maybe by default, it makes the original a cult classic. Could I, be. Could be. Yeah, this could fall into one of those things like, man, just because you're not getting it now, this clearly has. There are literal people who have defended this movie. So you have the base there, which is good. You've established people who are willing to follow you. Now you got to follow that up and win back the other people. If you can make that movie that will appeal to each crowd and you draw more people in, and, and you get people like us who are jaded and cynical to go, you know what? That first movie was rough, but man, my God, two and three. Now, now we got something. Now we got a good franchise mm -hmm. we're looking forward to every year. Like uh, Saw did it too, right? I mean, poor example, well, Saw well, one's the best, but yeah. I mean, the, I enjoy the follow-up movies. I, I do too. It's amazing that you had a movie each year. Every year, like without fail, every like Halloween, one, yeah, that every was Halloween, amazing. it was one of the few horror films that came out on like or in October, which is just ridiculous to me that they didn't more filmmakers didn't do that. Like, yeah, yeah, let's put out Rob Zombie's Halloween in August. That was Idiot. that right there already killed the momentum. That's probably yeah, the yeah, at least in, like, <laughs> late September, maybe, or like at least the first weekend of October. I don't whatever it's called halloween damn it but it, it's just it's just one of those things where um yeah you're gonna learn from your mistakes and as i said before hopefully hopefully we get to see some great movies out of it and in retrospect you know when you're talking about the cult classic uh aspect um it very well could make to that point uh but as of right now he made yeah. a bad movie and hopefully, it, <laughs> hopefully he will learn from his experience and give us something that's more worthwhile and more up to the standard of his uh, potential. And 
which sounds very snooty of me just coming out of my mouth. Just like, I just seem like a snooty prick just saying that I feel like that, but it's very true. Uh, cause this is just the first step and hopefully you'll take many more and people will revere you as, as a good director because you hey, do look, have Nick potential Cage works just, with independent directors. Get, right. Get Nick you, Cage. you have potential. Don't fuck it up. All right. Have a good night, guys. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this conversation. And uh, even though it went on for over two hours, uh, but hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, and if you want to see more, uh, just let me know. Uh, leave a like button, subscribe, subscribe to Zod as well. And also share this out. Uh, you share out clips, clip out some certain moments that you think we made good points on or maybe bad points just to, you know, fuck with us. That'd be good. Uh, <laughs> whatever you want to do and leave your thoughts in the comment section down below. Who did it better? Why was it better? Was it something that we talked about? Is there something that we missed? Is there something that we missed with uh, either of the films that were very glaring to you? Please. Even though we're great and we always get everything and you're completely wrong, we still want no, to No, no, don't, don't discourage them, you bastard. Don't Sorry, discourage villain. anybody. <laughs> no, leave, leave us your thoughts in the comment section down below. And uh, as always, uh, live long and proper and uh, have a great day. We'll see you in a couple of weeks for Scream 6. Very much looking forward to that.